There is one catalyst that can amplify your organization's creativity and ignite its impact. Today, we will talk about the importance and value of diversity in our social networks. I'm Matt Abrahams, and I teach strategic communication at Stanford Graduate School of Business. Welcome to Think Fast, Talk Smart, the podcast. Today, I am super excited to be joined by Adina Sterling, who is an associate professor of organizational behavior at Stanford GSB. Adina studies the causes and consequences of human relationships in organizations and markets, and she teaches a popular elective class called Equity by Design and runs a lab by the same name. Welcome, Adina. I'm super excited to get a chance to talk with you. Thanks, Matt. It's great to be here. Yes. Well, thanks for being here. So let's go ahead and get started. A lot of your work focuses on social networks. For many of us, social networks refer to applications like Facebook or Twitter and LinkedIn. What do you mean by social networks and what types of insights can you learn from them? Right. So that's a great question to begin with. And you're absolutely right. We hear social networks and we think about Facebook and LinkedIn and Instagram and things that 12 and 13 year olds are more savvy (laughs) at us than we are. So what they are, are the patterns of interactions and communication that happens between various entities. So social scientists will study social networks that occur between individuals, between groups, between teams, between societies, organizations, institutions. And so social networks is a construct that travels different levels and levels of analyses. And we care about them because a lot of the outcomes that individuals, groups, and organizations experience have to do with the social networks that they have, where they are within this pattern of relationships. And so oftentimes we get a lot of our social resources from social networks, and so they can be awfully important. I see. So a social network is essentially a way of mapping the different connections and relationships we have within groupings of people. That's right. As you know, Adina, this podcast focuses a lot on communication. So I'm wondering, what role does communication play within social networks? And have you been able to determine any best practices that organizations use to maximize the impact of communication within their networks? So communication and the social networks are foundational to why social networks exist. Mm -hmm. So if I can't communicate effectively to you or you to me, our social tie goes away. So a lot of the way that we understand social ties is the transfer of information, Mm -hmm. advice, care, social support, and, of course, being able to communicate those aspects of life effectively. So the kind of care that somebody would express to another Mm -hmm. depends on their ability to communicate that in a way that's empathetic and real. And so communication is foundational to, to social networks. What can organizations do to help employees communicate and help employees communicate with clients and other stakeholders. I always hear Matt go back to the importance of culture. Mm. So if the organization can put into place the right norms, the right expectations, the right language so that people can communicate and they sort of know where the boundaries are and what, you know, where where not to cross boundaries, those can be really helpful ways of helping employees communicate their wants and needs, their ideas to one another and to other stakeholders. Wow. So I just learned that I've been a social networking researcher for all these years and I didn't know that that's what I was. Uh, No, that's great. So uh, thank you for for sharing that the communication is absolutely critical. Uh, in understanding social networks. And it sounds like organizations that put a priority on helping people communicate the value of communication and, and allowing people to feel that notion we've talked about before on this podcast of psychological safety to feel comfortable communicating. That's right. Can be much more effective. Do you mind if I add one oh, other please. piece yeah. to mm-hmm. what organizations can do? What you just teed up made me think of this. Another important part of communication that organizations can tap into is the notion that it can be multifaceted. Mm. So verbal communication, of course, is one way of communicating, auditory communication, but it's not the only way. Mm -hmm. And so especially organizations that recognize 
neurodiversity, for example, will do things in a team setting like take pauses, give people think time, allow right. people to write down ideas in the middle of a meeting so that people's natural strengths, because we all have different strengths, don't all dominate so that, you know, only certain people don't get to communicate their ideas. Organizations that do this well collect ideas from many different people and allow for communication to come through many different mediums. I love that idea. And it brings us really nicely into my next set of questions around what you teach in your equity by design class and in the, the lab that you run. So it's really important from what I'm hearing you say that organizations don't just lock into one way of communicating, that they be very open to multiple ways and they put a priority on communication. I will often recommend that organizations take time to reflect on their communication at the end of meetings or one-on-one -on -one interactions, spend a few minutes just talking about the quality of the communication, not rehashing what was said necessarily. And also as part of performance reviews and other big meetings, talk about communication. And what you add so nicely to it is it's not just one monolithic thing. There are lots of different ways to communicate. And we want to make sure that everybody can bring their best selves to the communication. Can you share with us some of the concepts you teach in your equity by design class? as well as the topics you study in your Equity by Design lab. What role does communication play in these efforts? Sure. So my class, as you mentioned, is on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Right. And, and those are really three different Absolutely. ideas. In thinking about the importance of communication, it is awfully important for diversity. So mm -hmm. let me say a little more please, about that. We, we've now had several decades of, of work done by social scientists on what diversity buys you. What is the diversity bonus is, mm -hmm. has been the question. Mm -hmm. And when people from different backgrounds that have different ideas come together, what research has shown is that they tend to outperform from a creativity and innovation standpoint, uh -huh. groups that are more homogenous. But the key to having those benefits come about is the ability for people to be able to communicate. So you could have a really diverse group. Right. And if everybody shuts down and nobody's communicating, <laughs> it becomes really hard to build off of each other's ideas, to have those creative breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. You need people to be willing to share their mm -hmm. thoughts and their ideas. And so that's that's one way communication is, is really key. The importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion are, are critical for many aspects of an organization, for sure. And I'm curious to hear even more but in terms of communication, they drive creativity and innovation. And it seems to me that it's so important for organizations to recognize that and celebrate it and to encourage it. Have you seen best practices or do you teach best practices to really help leaders amplify the diversity that they have so they can get those results that they're looking for? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for my class, Matt, I have right. what I call a better practices playbook. So oh, I love it. So spend, well, first, before yeah. you go, why better practices and not best practices? Okay. So that is a good question. <laughs> the reason is that when it comes to this topic, what I found is that sometimes the, the great can be the enemy of the good. And so when I first began teaching this yeah. topic at Stanford, I had people say to me, oh my gosh, one of the things I'd like about your class is that we're taught to incrementally just get going, right? It doesn't, we don't have to have the perfect plan for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Okay. What we can do is, is begin and have better practices from where we're at. So anyway, it's just, it's the idea of that the great shouldn't be the enemy of the good. I Let's love it. Just I'm get, calling them yeah, better practices. Better practices. All right. right. So what are so, some from your class? Yeah. So one important one is to understand that because diversity has benefits, sometimes you need to do things differently as a leader. The thing that diversity really helps you with is sometimes slowing down to take the time to be creative, to make better choices and have better solutions. So there was this terrific study done um, that was actually looking at juries. And they found, these researchers, that juries that were more diverse, they were more deliberate. People came more prepared and, and better able to argue their ideas. 
and outcomes generally reviewed as being better when, when there are these more diverse groups. And so and so the first, really, it's about buying in and <laughs> understanding that it might take a little bit longer to build a diverse team, um, but that has some benefits uh, in the long run. So taking the time and being thoughtful about putting the team together and then giving the team space to actually leverage the diverse perspectives that they bring can be really helpful. That's right. That's right. A lot of business is so much about rushing and being first and fast. And, right. and it sounds like what I'm hearing you say is sometimes being more deliberate and slowing down can give you an advantage mm -hmm. as well. Yes. Great. Yeah. And then also building up the right culture around the team becomes key. Right. So that helping people feel connected and safe and that their That's voice right. has value. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. Uh, many of those listening uh, into our podcast today work for organizations that are in various stages of implementing their DE&I <laughs> programs. Uh, based on your experience, what are some of the best ways to implement, assess, and reinforce these programs? Sure. So I like to say if you can, get buy-in from the top. Sure. Uh, oftentimes, there are grassroots efforts within organizations that are terrific around DEI, mm -hmm. and leadership can feel as though they're responding mm -hmm. to DEI efforts. And, and that's fine, but if there can be leadership from the top mm -hmm. and a collaboration with employees on what their DEI needs are and B needs are, that can be a, a really effective way to go about things. Um, the other concept I would I would just add here is that I do like to talk about within organizations what I think of as edge cases. So we all think about innovation and kind of being at the bleeding edge. The analogy doesn't quite work the same way, but traditionally there are more marginalized groups within organizations. And so sometimes sitting with and taking the temperature of those groups and figuring out how to implement policy changes that are effective there can have enormous spillover effects for everyone. So, for example, if an organization goes in and surveys all recent parents, mothers, fathers, and the like, about time off policies. They'll hear a lot of things in there that could also help older individuals that are taking care of their parents, um, individuals that have family that are further away. And so organizations that sit and listen to more marginalized groups oftentimes can use those insights and blow them out and, and have effective policies for multiple groups within organizations. That's really, really fantastic. It's, it starts with listening mm -hmm. and then collaboration, and it has to come not just from the grassroots, but also from the top, and, and that's what leads to success. Uh, more and more as I do these podcasts, the, the role of listening and taking the time to, to hear what others are saying is really a key ingredient to success in many aspects. And it sounds like DE&I is no different. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ad address another area of your research that I found really fascinating. You've identified something you term the confidence gap. As a potential contributor to gender differences we see in the workplace, such as equity and pay, can you explain what the confidence gap is and how can it be addressed? Sure. So... I'm glad we're chatting about this because sometimes the confidence gap can be misunderstood. So okay. I'll, I'll first explain it and Please. then talk about where it comes from because that's a real key to this. So the confidence gap, that idea came from a study that I and some researchers here at Stanford did mm -hmm. where we tracked the outcomes of college students in engineering programs at 27 institutions and it was a longitudinal study. So we were interested in people's what we called self-efficacy, how much confidence they had in their ability to do engineering and STEM and mathematics type problems early on, how that changed over time, where they were with respect to self-efficacy as they were entering the workplace, and then what happened after they entered. And what we found is that women and men did differ in the level of self-efficacy they they felt or they reported. Okay, so this is a self-perceived measure, if you will, of your own confidence in in your ability to solve engineering problems, so okay. on and so forth. And so we found we did find a, a gender gap. We found that men had higher levels of confidence than women. We found that 
this effect held within specific kinds of engineering programs. And so engineers, I was an engineer as an undergraduate uh -huh. in, at Ohio State. So I, the chemical engineer, there's a lot of engineering snobbery. So oh. sometimes it's like, oh, well, the aerospace engineers are this smart and the electrical are this smart and the chemical are this smart. So anyway, we right. wanted to look within engineering uh -huh. major and we still found this effect. So it wasn't that women were only going into some engineering fields and then others. Right. And that was leading to this difference in the confidence gap. It, it remained within engineering major. It also remained with, we looked within GPA. So when we looked at only those with sort of a 3.9 GPA or above, which right. believe it or not, they, the number of students in our study had that, right. had that GPA. It remained there, it remained within every GPA category. And so one of the things we then did, Matt, was say, okay, does this help explain the gender wage gap? And we found that it did. We did a mediation analysis on the first salaries that people received, mm -hmm. and, and it did. It turned out that once we accounted for for the level of self-confidence people had, most of that gender gap could be explained away. Now, the thing I want to emphasize, though, is that this gap doesn't come from you know, the sky. Right. <laughs> it comes from our society that right. provides expectations and norms about who can be an engineer, who should be confident in their ability to be an engineer. So I want to be really careful that this is not about blaming right. you know, women that are less confident. This is coming from a society that conditioned women in different ways from men to be you know, confident in their abilities. And so so one of the things that sometimes I'll get asked is, okay, well, what can we do about right. this? And I'm really quick to say, okay, this is not a fix the women right. you know, right. thing. Uh, right. There's lots of things that we can do, especially within STEM where our study focused. We know that when you diversify the faculty and you have more female faculty, that can right. be an important signal that can have important signaling value uh, for women and increase their confidence. You can structure teams in ways that there are more, there's greater gender balance. And so something that can happen in engineering, and this doesn't necessarily reflect my experience, but <laughs> there's right. some research and also anecdotes I'll share that the, in, in engineering programs, you'll have five person teams sometimes one woman, and then that one woman is the note taker. The, the right. So there's all sorts of small um, daily kinds of interactions and ways right. of communicating within groups that can lead people to have different levels of confidence in their abilities. And we just need to figure out ways to stop all of this. There's There's been an underlying theme in our conversation today, Adina, around the impact of the culture and the norms within organizations or in the case of what we just discussed society uh, and and to what i'm taking away and i'd love for you to verify this is is that to make the kind of change that you're talking about we've talked about in other episodes here it's really about looking at the larger factors that are influencing the communication or behavior that's and and that's where you have to to adjust and, and adapt and focus to have the kind of impact that we're talking about and while that can feel daunting, I think you've got some evidence, and, and I know in what you teach, some better practices for how to go about doing that. So, so thank you. Before we end, I'd like to ask you the same three questions I ask everyone who joins me. Uh, does that sound all right? That sounds great. All right. If you were to capture the best communication advice you have ever received as a five to seven word presentation slide title, what would it be? What a question. What came to mind for me is paint a picture, tell a story. Ooh, I love it. Paint a picture, tell a story. So we've talked a lot about storytelling here, but but give me some more detail about painting a picture. Sure, I like it. Sure, sure. So when people are hearing your story that you're communicating, if, if they can put themselves in your shoes uh -huh. or your sets of experiences, okay. that's the picture I'm talking about. Right. And I do think so much of DEI comes from perspective taking mm -hmm. and empathy for right. those that might be different from right. us. And so that ability to say, here's how I felt in this moment and why 
that can be, a, a, I think, an effective way of communicating. So true. And as a communicator, if you're looking to paint that picture so people can understand your perspective, it changes your focus. It changes what you're going to say and how you say it. It's going to be about emotion. It's going to be about detail. And that's so critical. And I think when we reflect on the speakers that move us the most or mm. the ones that can do that well, which leads me nicely, I think, to our second question, which is, who is a communicator that you admire and why? All right. So I, I'm going to not directly answer this question, but okay, answer it in the, the way right. that uh, that this came to me, which is I grew up going to church. I grew up going to black churches. And within that tradition, there are wonderful or yeah. orators with just really w rich linguistic styles. And, mm -hmm. and so I thought about a number of Black politicians today mm -hmm. from that tradition. So, you know, Stacey Abrams, Raphael Warnock, Barack Obama. Right. I could name others. You could name others. It also was a very rich oral tradition because during various parts of history, when Black people weren't allowed to be able to read and write, mm -hmm. what you understood came from the Black church on a Sunday morning. So anyway, those, those wow. I really admire that linguistic style and ways of, but that way of communicating. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing and thank you for taking a very different perspective on that. When I, when I think of the orations I've seen in black churches, the, the emotion and the ability to, to move those in the pews is, is fantastic. And while that style is very appropriate in that moment, Many of the aspects of what makes it effective apply in other types of communication as well. So I appreciate you highlighting that. Third and final question. What are the first three ingredients that go into a successful communication recipe? <laughs> sure. Okay. So the first is think about your audience yeah. and think about your audience's perspective and I feel privileged to be able to practice this mm -hmm. as a as an instructor, as a professor. Right. And for me, that was a big shift that I made in my teaching trajectory when I stopped trying to teach and I started trying to communicate. Those are I, I thought about those two things differently. And in fact, I think that communication is, is just king from that standpoint. The second one is use emotion rather than shy away from it. Okay. Yeah, I, I think lean in, lean in is, is fine. That can, that can be effective. And then less is more is my third one. So it, it does not surprise me at all that audience is something that, that you would absolutely see as important. And, and that distinction between teaching and communicating, I think all people who are really good instructors have that moment where mm -hmm. they realize it's not just about relaying information, it's about connecting. Mm -hmm. Emotion is critical. I think your other answers have highlighted that. It takes a confidence to be able to come to that place, to, to go in with, I've just got a couple ideas, not all of these ideas, mm -hmm. and, and I appreciate that. Well, Adina, thank you. This has been You're welcome. really, really insightful and a lot of fun and really helpful. Thank you for taking the time and, and for making us better and for sharing your better practices with us. You're welcome, Matt. It was a lot of fun. Great. You've been listening to another episode of Think Fast, Talk Smart, the podcast, a production of Stanford Graduate School of Business. This podcast was produced by Jenny Luna, Kevin Patel, and me, Matt Abrahams, with special thanks to Podium Podcast Company. To find more episodes, visit our website at gsb.stanford.edu, or find us wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube. For more business-related content, follow the Business School on social media at Stanford GSB. You can also find the podcast and follow us on LinkedIn and Instagram.